Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So let me start uh, with some congratulations uh, to this organization that now has a uh, fifth birthday. And uh, particularly con congratulations on uh, the vision uh, um, to back uh, somehow cryptocurrencies uh, that is really is a marvelous uh, technology, is extremely important these days. So thanks, uh, thanks also in particular to Richard Cole for this invitation. I'm very glad to be here with you today. So I've been uh, here to describe you know, my Algorand project, and it is an alternative bleep, uh, a blockchain. Uh, there are um, quite new, um, um, quite novel approach, so the alternative is in bold, and actually has been developed from scratch, because all of a sudden I, I decided that it would be a better idea to, rather than patch here and there, to um, uh, make you know, a totally new design. And in somehow, I'd like also to convince you that this technology, never mind that right now has uh, some uh, reaches, some level of quality, but actually has uh, embedded uh, the seeds uh, to enable some continuous pro uh, pro uh, progress. So that is a claim that I have to defend uh, somehow during the talk. So everybody knows what a blockchain is, uh, readable by all, writable by all, and tamper-proof. Everybody knows what it's good for. In fact, actually, it's good for many other things, even curing the common gold. This guy is un unhappy, goes to the blockchain. I mean, it cures everything, okay? So, it is a dream infrastructure. The only question that there is, uh, there is an argument is how to implement it. And when you want to implement a blockchain, there are essentially two aspects. One is building the chain. That is the same as solved problem. You hash the block, the hash of a block is, a, uh, is an item in the next block, and so on and so forth. They all battle, they all struggle, they all creativity in the design and everything is how the hell do we choose the next block in the sequence. That's where, where battle is fought. And uh, today, I'd like to contrast first Bitcoin and Algorand, because everybody's familiar with Bitcoin, but I'd like also to uh, differentiate Algorand for uh, other serial approaches. Now, we cannot say enough good things about Bitcoin, right? For historical reasons, for pioneering reasons, for uh, um, having been you know, um, uh, a trendsetter. But somehow today, uh, given that you not know essentially all what is good about Bitcoin, I have to focus on what is, uh, in my opinion, and not only in my opinion, uh, needs to be changed if we want to, uh, uh, to continue in this tradition. So the main assumption, as you know, is the honest majority of mining power. And, uh, and what are the, somehow the, the technical problems? The, the main idea is the consensus by proof of work, which itself is um, um, a great idea. But there are technical problems. So first of all, is very wasteful, the system of every resource that is inside, in particular electricity, and all this uh, cost somehow to be borne by somebody and ultimately have been borne by us. Right now the blocks are subsidized, but once the blocks are not subsidized, <laughs> they, our fees are going to be needed to sustain the thing, and so this very high cost uh, become very high, high transactional cost as well. Then uh, there is um, something unexpected, and that uh, there is an, uh, an exogenous concentration of power in Bitcoin. So it started like you know decentralized uh, currency, and somehow centralization re re uh, appears again uh, uh, in the form of mining pools, and somehow free mining pools control uh, uh, Bitcoin right now. And Ethereum, last time I looked, even two. So we are not going to say that one is centralized, that two or three is decentralized. That is not uh, the case. That's a pity. And we can discuss maybe why that happened. And uh, the other one is that that is actually a source of a vulnerability. So somehow the miners are actually uh, relatively poor in relative terms. Uh, in fact, very, very often they go belly up. Um, and so if you have somebody with low margin, with extreme control, and a few, few people in numbers with low margins, uh, they are really um, a target for corruption or even for control by governments and everybody else. Then uh, there is an issue of scalability. 
so somehow my Bitcoin um, is somehow seven transactions a second, and I don't mind expensive fast, but somehow expensive slow is a little bit too much, perhaps. And so we don't know how many active users we, we can really support with seven transactions a second. Finally, the, uh, even the blockchain is, uh, is always drawn as a linear uh, sequence of blocks, one after the other, in, in particular, there are actually forks, not as extreme as I was in the pictures, but the, the forking requires ambiguity because you cannot rely on a block as soon as it appears because it can be bypassed by somehow, some, by a fork, you know, earlier on, and, uh, and that, is a, uh, that is a problem, in particular in a financial setting. Think about, you know, financial uh, a world in which a wire transfer with some probability is revoked. And uh, how do you defend against uh, this ambiguity of forks? By waiting. So you don't consider yourself paid because a payment to you appeared in the latest block. You want to make sure this block is somehow six deep, so which means an hour, or 12 deep is two hours. So there's not a way to pay a, a bill at a restaurant because you have to engage with lengthy discussions with your waiter <laughs> because everybody wants to be paid. So finally, security. Somehow, the claim is that a Bitcoin, if nothing else, it may be slow, it may be expensive, but at least it's secure. And um, this is not quite so, in my opinion, if you consider network attacks. Right now, uh, the bulk of our analysis of Bitcoins and other cryptocurrency focuses on uh, selfish mining, all protocol attacks. So I don't send the messages that I'm supposed to send. But a, a true determined adversary is going to tamper with the very communication network in which the protocol is run. And uh, such attacks can be devastating, devastating on Bitcoin and all other uh, things. But somehow nobody gets worried. I don't know why. All right. So if you look at this list, and uh, that was my, in some sense, um, it's a typical list. Uh, you can add a few more items. But I think uh, there is enough to try to get a fresh start. And so Algorand tries to do a fresh start, which is based on effortless one-by-one -one Byzantine agreement. It's a bit too much, so let me divide it uh, for you. Let's start with effortless one-by-one. -one. OK, so in every cryptocurrency, the genesis block is for free. We don't need to agree on it. It's part of the very description of the system. So B1 is the genesis block. We all know what this block is. The next block is up to, the, to debate. So next to the Genesis block, you see a favor, a universal symbol of effortlessness and lightness. And as this uh, favor gently falls down, the, the, uh, the, chain, the blockchain unfolds. All right. So you say, wait a minute. This is uh, before there were forks, now there is a single chain. What happens to forks? What happens to proof of work? Guess what? In Algorand, there are no forks, and there are no proofs of work. What you have is a clean blockchain, as is written in the books. However, to achieve this picture, there is going to be a lot of technology behind it to achieve this linearity and, uh, and, uh, and clean uh, design. OK, so this much for effortless. There is no consumption or anything in, in Algorand. And uh, how about Byzantine Agreement? Byzantine Agreement is actually a very robust protocol, Peace, Shock, and, Long, um, 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 and, and Lamport. Uh, in the 80s, came up with this idea. It's a communication protocol in which, say, the, one, the people in these rooms, they can commun they communicate so to achieve at the end of our conversation on two properties, agreement and consistency. Agreement means that no matter what values we start with, and we can start indeed with different values, at the end of the conversation, all the good guys end up outputting the same value. Now, it is clear in this picture who is good and who is bad. I hope it's a kind of a universal uh, situation here, too. And so what is uh, consistency? Consistent means just in case we started with the same value, then not only we must all the honest people must agree on a common value, but they are forced to agree on that value that everybody started with. OK? Now, Agreement without consistency is trivial. If you want to agreement, no matter what value you start, in zero step, you output zero. 
And these are the orders any honest pro processor, honest means following uh, the protocol, output zero. So you achieve agreement immediately. But however, by outputting zero all the time, it does not satisfy consistency because uh, just in case you started with 10, you should uh, agree on 10 and not on zero. So doing these things together is actually quite tricky. But I'd like to you to um, uh, absorb this picture and I'll tell you a, a little bit of what um, uh, the, the, the deep secret, which is what are the values we are going to discuss is, is what is the next block, okay? So the next block, if somebody proposes a next block, we can start with very different values because the proposer may be malicious. They can send different blocks to different people. But at the end of the conversation, everybody will agree on a common block. Moreover, if the initial block were, was the same because the, the initiator, the proposer of the block was really honest and sent the same block, then we must agree on that block, okay? So it's a little bit premature, but we can see already that there is, uh, uh, just to, to share with you, what is behind uh, using Byzantine agreement for this. There are, however, a few challenges. So if you spend some time, as, uh, as I was saying, I have, I co-authored uh, <laughs> a paper in 1985 on Byzantine agreement. It's the worst protocol in this setting on, on the surface because it's extremely slow, very message in in intensive, and very stage intensive, many waves, 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 waves of messaging. It's really the worst that you can think of. And moreover, it envisages that, like the people in this room, we know who the players are. Over the internet, in a permissionless system, heaven knows who are the players, right? So, it has a good appeal, uh, intellectual appeal, that everybody agrees, but also has some deep challenges. But if we solve the challenges, I claim, and I continue to claim until I, hopefully I convince you, not only we have a new blockchain, but actually we have a, an extra gear in our blockchain. All right. So summarizing, so Algorand is based on a message passing, old-fashioned Byzantine agreement, not to be confused with Byzantine practical fault tolerance because it now is a fashion. You take something which has nothing to do with Byzantine agreement, you put the Byzantine in front of it, it means something else, and then uh, you evoke the power of Byzantine. That's, uh, so Byzantine agreement is one thing, and uh, beware of cheap imitations. So the main assumption is that the majority of the money in the system is in honest hands. Okay, I'd like to spend just a few seconds to, to contrast this assumption, like the majority of the money in equipment is in honest hands of traditional assumption of proof of work. I like this assumption, why? Because money is fungible. In some sense, with money you can buy anything you want. So if the majority of, first of all, never enter in a system where you know that or suspect that the majority of money is in dishonest hand. You don't want to be in this distinguished company. But assume instead that you end up there, if the majority of the money is in dishonest hand, these dishonest people with this money, they can buy anything they want, including money and equipment. So <laughs> if uh, the majority of the money is in dishonest hands, also the majority of the money and equipment is going to be. So that is a bit of a, le a less assumption. Okay, let me tell you right away what are the technical advantages are. First of all, triviality of computation. In, uh, in Algorand, uh, there is no consumption of any energy. Uh, uh, we save the planet, so to speak. So define it. All you have to do is uh, to produce a block, a few additions, a few comparisons, verify a digital signature, maybe digitally sign a message. Nothing to write home about it. Then there is a true de decentralization. There are no special classes of anything. There is only one class of, of people. The users, the people who have money in the system, okay? And they can conduct their own affairs by themselves, unaided by miners or anybody else. Finally, there is a finality of payments. So when you are paid, you are actually paid. As soon as you see a block, you can actually bet your money on the block because the block will never disappear from the blockchain. Why not? Because there are no forks. This is actually a white lie because of forks may occur in Algorand, but with very low probability. How low? 10 to the minus 18. 10 to the minus 18 is a strange constant, constant and, uh, uh, and it's strange for the simple reason that I made it up. Let me tell you why I made it up. Because 10 
to the power 18 with add minus happens to be the number of seconds that the physicists tell have elapsed since the Big Bang until now. Put in another way, yes, there may be a fork, but you have to wait the life of the universe to see one. Okay, so for all practical reasons, it's forkless. Then there is a, a scalability, and um, actually scales perfectly. In a distributed setting, what does this mean? In a distributed setting, you know, block, if you want to be distributed, you don't ask the block to an, an higher authority, you propagate the block around. So you cannot so, uh, com uh, generate a block faster that you can disseminate, propagate the previous block. Because you ought to know the previous block to determine whether the current block is valid or not. But this is the only limitation in, uh, in algorithm. Okay? And by the way, this limitation is certainly inherited by Bitcoin, but is not the only limitation. Bitcoin has to spend 10 minutes a block. Why? Because in Bitcoin, blocks are propagated slowly? No, blocks are propagated even in mom and papa um, modems uh, in, in a few seconds. That is not the problem. But you must make the riddle so hard that you have one solution every 10 minutes, or else, rather than having occasional forks, you are going to have forks galore, and so many forks, exponential explosion of forks, so that you can never distinguish where the longest chain is, because in this mass of spaghetti, it's even hard to distinguish you know, <laughs> which chain is longest. So in, uh, there is no other, this other condition. Okay? In, in, in Algorand, you can propagate a block as fast as you can generate it. Uh, uh, sorry, you can propagate it. Okay? And finally, security, uh, the system is secure against a bad adversary. How bad? Very bad, OK? However, do not fear, because we are here to defend you against the bad guy. So let me define the bad guy. This bad guy can actually immediately corrupt any player he wants, provided that he can, does not corrupt more than a third of a player. But corrupting a third of a player on the internet, that's a very challenge indeed. And uh, moreover, if, you, if he corrupts you, he can organize you and all the corrupted guys perfectly. No issues about this. Everybody becomes a zombie at the orders of a bad guy. And he can attack the protocol, and he can attack also the communication network, which I think is key. The only thing he cannot do is that he cannot forge your digital signature. But this, not, e not even uh, an enemy country, an entire country with huge resources could do. So do we need to be so adversarial? I believe, yes, we should be. Why? Because uh, there is enormous value in a blockchain. A proper blockchain, right now we are, we are debating, is Bitcoin value as much, you know, does it deserve the value? A true blockchain ought to be valued in the trillions. And when there are trillions of dollars at stake, bad guys and very well endowed bad guys uh, pop up like mushrooms after the rain. So, that is not, so if you don't prepare for the worst, the worst will happen. This is it's pretty much of a guarantee. Okay. So, so far, we have done a bunch of claims. It says, we claim to be scalable. We claim to be secure. We claim to be no forks. We claim to be no waste of energy. We, we claim everything. How does it work? Let me give you a very high level description. We can uh, uh, somehow dig down a little bit more. Algorand works in two magic phases, where the magic is actually replaced by mathematics. But it's a bit easier to talk about magic than it is to talk about mathematics. So let me indulge uh, in talking about magic instead. First phase is the proposal phase. What happens in this phase? By magic, one user out of the billions of users in, in, in existence is somehow selected. And by magic, his or her public key becomes common knowledge among all users. That's a pretty a lot of magic. What does this user do? This user essentially proposes a new block based on the valid transaction he or she sees that have not been reflected in the blockchain yet, right? So it's very obvious. I've seen uh, 1,500 transactions. They're all valid to me relative to the blockchain so far. Let me put to them together in a new block, and I propagate the block, and I even sign the block. And because by magic, everybody knows my public key. I'm the proposer of the next block. Everybody knows that I, they receive this from me. End of phase one. What happens in phase two? There is going to be a committee of, say, a thousand people that by magic are selected at random among the billions of users in the system again. 
and, uh, and their keys are also by magic get known by everybody. And what do these 1,000 people do? They reach Byzantine agreement about the block proposed by the first person. Why that? For the reason I said before, because in any society there is a percentage of criminals. Maybe 1%, maybe 2 maybe 3 If you are really living in a very dangerous society, 10%, maybe 20 But we're not going to be in a majority, right? Otherwise, there is no society. For the, it's a, if uh, in a society in which the judges put a uh, jail of the innocent uh, routinely, and so uh, there is no society. There is a, we are in a different type of, of uh, in a jungle more than a society. So the idea is that uh, when you select a person at random, if there is 10% of, uh, of the criminals, he couldn't find a bad actor. And a bad actor, what can he do? He can send you a, a, a block and me a different block and her another block yet. So thereby, it's not true anymore that we are in a, everybody knows of, of the same blockchain. The blockchain looks very different to different people. Instead, even if there is a 10% of bad actors, when you choose at random a thousand of them, with overwhelming probability, the majority of this committee is going to be made by honest people, where honesty only means here following the protocol. And so if you find a block that is digitally signed by 750, say, of the 1,000 people that you know are part of the committee to approve this block, that is the next block, the end. Okay? So recapping, one user randomly sele selected proportionally to the money he has in the system, in parentheses, what does this user do? Proposes a block. What do the other 1,000 people do? They agree on, on the block proposed by the first person. Now you know there is a single block. That's why it does not fork, and uh, we are done. And everybody sees the majority of these 750, say, signature backing the block. You know that is the next block, period. Okay? All right. At this high level, things work. In reality, they should have a lot of questions in your mind, and they, uh, they sh there should be better be a matching number of uh, answers to these questions. And so let me guide you the three most popular questions uh, and answer. And um, mind you, that we are going to do things a little bit weirdly, or uh, so we are going to be a bit. Uh, uh, we are going to start taking rabbit out of a hat. Because if we don't do so, we end up slowly, slowly, slowly doing Bitcoin, prime, double prime, we fall into the same traps. The first question is, that I've been asking, says, who selects the committee? And the answer, quite counterintuitively, is each committee member secretly selects himself. Says, gee, if there is a bad idea, this is one. Right? Because if I'm a bad guy and I am a liberty of selecting myself, I select myself to approve this block and the next block, I select myself all the time because I want to be in charge right, of controlling which blocks get approved. But not so fast. In order to select yourself, what you have to do is that you have to win a cryptographically fair lottery in which you cannot cheat to improve the odds of being selected, not even by epsilon, but even by smallest amount. Okay, But if you win this lottery, you actually can prove to others that you have won. Let me tell you what drive through this lottery is about. Let's assume that initially there is a million users in the system, and everybody has roughly the same amount of money. This is an easy assumption to describe algorithms somehow. So we wanted a committee of a thousand people. So each one of us should be elect, elect, selecting himself with probability one over a thousand, because a million divided by a thousand is a thousand, which I, I want a thousand people committee. OK, so if I notice that when I run, when I see the, the, uh, the block proposed by the first user, I start asking, am I by any chance one of the 1,000 people devoted to approve this block? I run this micro lottery, individual lottery in the privacy of my computer. OK, it takes me a microsecond to do it. And you are going to do the same. It takes the same microsecond, but with your computer. Okay, And so if I win, then what I do is that I propagate, here is my winning ticket, pay attention to my opinion because it counts about this block, and here is my vote, up or down, about the validity of this block. Okay? Good. By the way, the probability 
of winning my lottery is proportional to the amount of money I have in the system. Why? Because over, over, um, otherwise we are going to have uh, similar tax, right? In which I can split myself in Silvio, Silvio Prime, Silvio Double Prime, Silvio Million. And you know, if, uh, if one, any one of them wins, I win. But if I have a million dollars in one single key, or a, a million keys with one dollar each, my probability of being selected remains absolutely the same. That's why it is done this way. Now, let me tell you why this is super fast and is super secure. Super secure. Why is super fast? Because this lottery is an individual lottery, right? I do a very simple cryptographic operation which tells me whether I won or not. And if I win, I get a winning ticket and I propagate it together with my opinion. So that is fast because it's a microsecond for me. In the same microsecond, everybody does the same thing. Even if it's synchrony, in two microseconds, we are done. Why is this super secure? Because if I am the bad, scary guy that I, I'm telling you is going to come up in these blockchains, what I want to do? I want to corrupt the committee. What is my problem, as bad as I am? That I don't know who is in the next committee. Because the next committee, the, the components are, of this com the members of this committee are self-selected in secret in, by winning, by running their own lottery. I can look around Amsterdam and try to figure out who, or, or, or another continent in Malaysia, wherever I want to go, but I have no idea who is going to be part of this committee. Yes, but when the committee member propagate their winning ticket and their opinion about the block, now I know who they are and I can attack them. But now at that point is too late. Why? Because whatever they had to say, they've already said it. And even though I'm a bad, scary guy, I cannot put back in the bottle their message of a winning ticket and opinions about the block no more than the NSA could put back in the bottle a message virally propagated by WikiLeaks. Okay? So corrupting beforehand is impossible because I don't even know whom I should corrupt. And corrupting after the facts is too late. Okay? That's roughly why the system uh, works, is fast and is secure. Well, okay, now we have to solve a way a Byzantine agreement problem among the first some participants at least, right? And didn't I say that the Byzantine agreement is extremely slow? And the answer is, well, traditional Byzantine agreement. But I designed one which is actually very fast and uh, no slow at all. In fact, it takes only an handful of steps to, uh, to finish, handful uh, like in the, in, in the hand. And, uh, and what do I do in a step? If I'm, I'm elected, by, so I send and propagate a single short message. So can I propagate you know, an handful of uh, single short messages? Yes, I can. Proof. One, two, three, four, five. That's it. I'm done. So what is uh, impossible here? There is very not impossible. So by the way, um, we can do even better than this. Uh, so, uh, but. That's for another discussion or um, um, for another day or after uh, the talk, if anything. OK, so now there is a very subtle point. It works against me, so I want to be honest. Let me share to you why this is problematic. Remember, we cannot reach agreement in a single step. So we must have at least an handful of steps. So in the first step, I said the adversary cannot corrupt you because he has no idea whom to corrupt. Then I said, after you actually say what you have to say, it's too late to corrupt you. Yes, but if the protocol takes, say, five steps, I cannot influence your first step because I didn't know you were going to show up in the committee. And once you said it, I could not stop your first messages. But you are going to speak another four times. So even though I did not corrupt you on time, I can corrupt you now with my superpower of in instantaneous corruption and control what you say, the second step, the third step, the fourth step, and the fifth step. And the answer is no. Why not? Because convening a committee is so damn si simple. It's this microsecond lottery that I'm going to have, the algorithm is going to have, a separate committee for each individual step. Okay? Each step X has its own 1,000-old committee. 
let me argue that this is nonsense. Why is nonsense? Because what is Byzantine agreement or, uh, or a protocol in general? It's an intelligent discussion, which at the end, we derive some conclusions. Assume we have a discussion in which the people in this room start saying one message, comes the adversary, kill us all, says no problem. We elect another group who is going to show up immediately after, or totally new people, and they say the second message. No sooner they say the second message, comes the adversary, kills us all, no problem. We get another third committee, okay? What kind of intelligent discussions you can have if you don't even know who is going to follow you, you cannot have a, a prior arrangement of what to say, and then you are, uh, you know, there's not a way to have any intelligent discussion. In fact, actually, that is not true. And because of this protocol that I told you over here, this Byzantine agreement, not only is super fast, but actually enjoys a property that after 40 years of being in the business, I never thought it was possible, which is player replaceability. Player replaceability means exactly what I said, that different players, totally unrelated set of players, can be in charge of different steps of a protocol without any prior arrangements. That is a brand new property. And uh, I believe that to transmit the essence, to make clear what it means, let me uh, tell you by picture. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. In an amateur video, like the one I'm going to show you, is worth a thousand pictures. OK? So here is the video. So we have been battling uh, the adversary now for half an hour, at least, right? And uh, we are. Uh, but we, our colors are still proudly flying. But the adversary is a very strongly entrenched position. But we are going to carry our flag across and clear the field from the enemy. In so doing, like in all battles of old, we are going to suffer very heavy casualty. But we will win in the end. OK? Ready. Protocol, charge. Blue players, red players. Green players, victory. Sound didn't help us, but your fantasy had sounds uh, and uh, it's, it's good effect. Okay, so what happens? You remember, think about General Lee and all those guys. Well, maybe uh, better. Not generally have been told is really bloodthirsty, but if the problem is winning, you don't care who carries the flag. Yes, somebody can be corrupted or killed in action, but the flag is kept by somebody else and moved around until we really succeed, we end the end of the protocol. So there have been different people in charge of the steps of the committee. So what is the relationship between these people? And the answer is none at all, because each one was chosen by a private individual lottery. I have no idea what is going to happen. They are different players. Worse than that, there are going to be different numbers, right? Because if I shoot for a thousand committee, sometimes I end up with 1,200, sometimes I end up with 900, and fluctuation like this. And there are no shared variables, OK? However, they are able to act as if they were a single committee. And by the way, this is necessary to have a truly distributed system. Because you all have see the claim, that is truly distributed, and then you scratch, scratch at the surface, there is a committee who is in charge for 10 steps. And why that? Oh, because 10 steps of the adversary does not have the power of the ability, the will to corrupt them all. Baloney. If there is a trillion dollars, you can do a lot of things, okay? Including controlling the network or doing anything, all kinds of bad things. So the only way to have a protocol that is really truly distributed against in the presence of a very bad adversary is to construct your protocol in a way that is player replaceable. So that each step of the protocol is carried out by a new, randomly selected, unpredictable, and totally unrelated set of players. Okay? And good news, this can be done. All right. Is this a proof of stake? Well, let me tell you, is something new. It is a pure proof of stake. What the hell is a pure proof of stake? Well, I find it easier to start by saying what a pure proof of stake is not. It is not delegated proof of stake, right? Delegated proof of stake 
means that we put in charge 21 people for this month to select to generate what the next block is. And don't worry, next month, different 21 people. So, well, this is, however, very centralized, right? It's centralized from the get-go. And even if, though we may be wise enough to put in charge very trustworthy 21 people, what is the danger? That the danger is that these guys are going to have a big target on their chest. Shoot me, shoot me, because their adversary, either he corrupts them, if a month is good enough to corrupt in a good old-fashioned way by bag of money, please do what I say, and here is uh, your reward, or if I cannot corrupt them, I can mount a denial of service attack against all of them. Can you mount a denial of service attacks against 21 people? What? Absolutely, yes. In fact, you can deny a service against a thousand people. Okay, that's not, that's not a problem. Okay, so the next uh, approach is bonded proof of stake. So bonded proof of stake, we are not delegated proof of stake. Delegated bad, bonded good. Okay, what is bonded? Bonded means that we don't allow 20 people. We allow 20 people, 200 people, 2,000 people, any pe anyone who is willing to push some money in the middle of the table where they cannot touch it, at stake in fact, they are in charge of generating the next block. And their influence is proportional to the money that they put in the middle of the table. Okay, it, does this work? Well, let me ask you a very simple question. How much of your disposable income you can afford to put in the middle of a table where you cannot touch and is not invested, not in bonds, not in stock, not in anything, hostage? And the answer is very little. So in a system like this, what you penalize is really the common user. So you are actually rolling a big red carpet to big thieves with deep pocket who are going to put a disproportionate amount of money in the middle of a table for the sole purpose of controlling the blockchain. That's at least is my fear. Now, the claim is, but if they misbehave, their money is confiscated. That's why it's at stake. And what is the answer? The answer is, first of all, most people are bad, but are not bad and stupid. That's a very rare combination. That's why they're dangerous. Because to, be, to have your money confiscated, you must do things like I sign A and I sign non-A. Then my money is confiscated. But if I, if I want to ignore your payments because I want to censor your payments, I want to detach you from your money, what am I going to do? Who is going to confiscate my money if I see I didn't see your payment? You can't sue me and you cannot confiscate my money either. Moreover, even though I lose my money, assume that I put $100 million in the middle of a table and I lose it, but I enrich myself by a few billion dollars on the side. That's just the cost of doing business, right? And it's actually very cheap investment even. So I think that these are actually forms of centralization that uh, are very dangerous in the long run, and we cannot really run uh, the money of the world in this way. Okay, now we are ready for the pure proof of stake. What does this mean? First of all, we punish nobody. Why? Couldn't we punish? Well, yes, we could, but, uh, that is, uh, but we should not rely on this ability, because the idea that you punish exposed somebody for a bad behavior is a fantasy. And if you start believing in your fantasies, pretty soon you are in trouble. Where is the money? The money is not separated from you. The money always remains in your wallet, at your fingertips, ready to be spent, where it should be. And somehow the system ought to work the magic that if most of the money on your fingertips, in your wallet, ready to be spent, where it should be, is in honest hands, the system works because it's impossible to cheat. You must make it impossible to cheat and not punish the cheaters. Punish the cheaters in a, in a global uh, currency is really, uh, is really optimistic, let us say. Okay? Okay. So let me tell you uh, summing up. Say there are, in Algorand, there are no forks. There are no miners. There is no proof of work, and there is no weight of confirmation. There is trivial computation, perfect scalability, and transaction finality, and actually great security. However, I want to highlight you 
properties that we are uh, rarely discussed, and I think actually are going to be very important. And uh, the first property is self-governance without hard forks. Let me explain why this is important. You know why it's important, because cryptocurrencies right now are ocean liners on autopilot. Okay, we can think very, very well how set the course of our ocean liner, but guess what? The course stays the same whether or not there is an iceberg, whether or not the, the weather changes. Nobody can predict exactly what people want and what they need, okay? We must be able to react during operations. But reaction in an ocean liner is not easy. Remember that when Bitcoin was facing, they uh, wanted to make the, the block from one megabyte to two megabyte, now we split the currency, right? That was the only way, because nobody can change anything. And so now we have Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Classic. So I believe uh, there is an Italian saying that uh, translates, I think, quite well. And it works on roughly like this follows. Uh, appetite grows while eating. So are you hungry? Ah, I'm not hungry, but I'll sit down anyway. So oh, now the food comes on the table. Oh, yeah, so and it's got a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But, you know, the app is, we are humans, right? What makes us unique human is that we want to improve ourselves over and over. So we are going to have always extra properties that we didn't know before, we didn't even think or wanted before. Now that we know, what are we going to do? For every new property, we go to a new cryptocurrency from scratch. We're going to split the previous one. That is not scalable. So what do we want? We, have a, we want to have a democratic mechanism to upgrade everything. And why Algorand is capable of doing this is because in, in its very foundation, it works by a proposal and agreement. Propose and agree. Propose and agree. What do we agree upon 99.9% .9 of the time? On the new block. But the same mechanism that allows you to agree on the new block allows you to agree on anything else that you want, in particular a new rule or a change in monetary policy. And now you must have a mechanism, put a proposal, blog, discuss it. In six months, once your proposal is on the blockchain, you have actually an agreement. We want the change or not. If the change is taken, is approved, everybody transition to, to the new one. Nobody can stop you from splitting the currency if you want to away, right? But what people don't want is to end up in the short, uh, in, in, in the short stick, right? Because if, if, if the currency is going to split, I, I'd love to be in where the most of the money is, in the vibrant economy. That's where I want to be. Unfortunately, I do not know where, what is the proposal that allows me to remain in the, the vibrant economy. I have two buttons in front of me, stay or go. And what, what I want to what I base my opinion on? I based on blogs, and people blogs are louder than others. They use all caps. They blog every day, but it doesn't mean that there are people behind them. There is no mechanism to measure the interest in this in any scientific and uh, rigorous way. But by sampling these users proportional to the money, you will know with great accuracy what most of the money in the system wants. And in an economic system, that's what you want. The other thing is that you have a security against arbitrary partition. Nothing talks about this aspect uh, of the business very much. But uh, it's very easy uh, to describe, right? So assume that there are miners and there are uh, in a proof of work and they are uh, well distributed over the five continents. Europe is one of these five continents. Let's assume somebody tampers with the, uh, the routers so that Europe is isolated with other four continents. By the way, to avoid that you are spotted right away that you are isolated, when you want to say Merry Christmas, it goes across to everybody. When you say Happy Birthday, it goes across. But Bitcoin control messages from Europe remains in Europe, and from the other four continents remains in the four continents. So what happens if I partition the network? And if I'm a bad guy, after partitioning the network, I spend a billion dollars in Europe and in the other four continents and receive goods for a billion dollars worth in Europe. Well, they are, I'm charged because I entered one of these blocks, my payment. But an hour, two hours later, you know, what happens is that the chain starts 
separating because the Europeans think that they are only ones and they have only a fifth of the miners. The chain of the rest of the world progresses four times as fast because they have four continents worth of miners. So after two hours, if I'm kicked out of the router because I'm exposed, or even because it's my interest to restore law and order, all the Europeans say, gee, we were working on the shorter chain. Look at this other chain much bigger. Everybody migrates to the other chain, and I double spend a billion dollars, OK? So we need to have, these are not fantasies. These are just beyond the corner, they're just expensive method to attack you know, a cryptocurrency. And we need security about that. And by the way, what do we need also is the secure incentives. Because we got into the business, that is the only thing that I think that uh, Mr. or Mrs. Nakamoto or the Nakamoto's, or maybe they, they may be, got it wrong, is the incentive scheme. They just, it's very easy to throw money around. And if you say, if I want to incentivize it, the generation of blocks, I should give money to whom? To the person who solves the riddle. That's so obvious. But it's so obvious, but it doesn't mean that it's right. Because what is a side product of this uh, incentive scheme? Is the rise of miners, and more recently, of mining pools, right? So that is, miners are a side product of an incentive scheme badly constructed. So what you want is an incentive scheme in which you can prove that the incentives are aligned with the goals of the cryptocurrency. And uh, there is more, but uh, let's stop it right here. I'd love to leave you guys with this image. This is the Julian Bridge in southern France that spans uh, the sides of the Calaon River and has uh, essentially united the people living on, on different opposite sides for over 2,000 years. So uh, in, uh, the, uh, this bridge has been in existence for 2,020 years. And until 2005, it, it allowed uh, uh, cars and trucks to go across, until somebody thought it was a good idea to prevent cars to go across you know, uh, the Julian Bridge. And it was unrepaired for at least a thousand years of Middle Ages. Okay, nobody, it was common property. Who repairs the Julian Bridge? Nobody. Still, the bridge stood. I believe that the, the shared ledger is as a useful as an infrastructure, any, any physical infrastructure that we have ever created, and is actually as beautiful as any physical infrastructure that we have ever constructed. So let's construct the uh, uh, right shared ledger correctly, and uh, let's do it together. Uh, thank you. Yes, I left uh, 10 minutes uh, just yeah. to have uh, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, Glad so, to hear. Uh, very much for what you said. Let's work together. We can also work together and share yeah. ideas. And, but that being said, I did have a question for you. That you, you talked about incentives. So if you would implement algorithm and um, non permission open setup, how would you uh, incentivize or what would you incentivize? Oh, right. So incentive is actually. So everybody confuses uh, somehow a cryptocurrency with an algorithm. It says, I have a new cryptocurrency. And it says, you see this algorithm. It's, like, it's an algorithm. It's not a cryptocurrency. A cryptocurrency is a grand design, which has economic sides, you know, and uh, economics primitives built in, the right economics primitives, and incentives in particular, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how do you incentivize it? So, uh, let me tell you a little bit that after 35 years of doing only crypto, cryptography, and uh, I got bored. So I started doing you know, uh, mechanism design. It's a branch of game theory and economics, and designing auctions, which essentially have to engineer incentives of doing all kinds of things. And so what I understood is that incentives are actually hard to design. 
But there are a few rules that I was able to borrow, or inspirationally, not, no, not mechanically, from uh, auction theory. And uh, uh, many of you, I assume, know about a second price auction, right? That you bid, there is a good for sale, I want to sell it by auction, and I ask you, case one, to bid, and the highest bidder gets it and pays his or her own bid. What happens in this rule? That you underbid what your value is, right? Because you say, hey, if I value the option, the item 100, if I bid 100, case one, I don't win, I don't pay, my utility is zero. Second one, if I win and I pay, and I win and I pay 100, something that I value 100, what is my gain? Zero again. So why don't I take a walk? There is such a beautiful day rather than being an auction. I have nothing to it. So this system in incentivizes underbidding. Because if you bid 80, well, your true price, your true value is 100. If you win it, you make the spread of 20. So it is called actually Dutch auction. Maybe it was invented here and it's a very old, uh, good idea. That somehow the rule is you bid, the highest bidder wins, but he or she pays is not to what is on bid, but the, the next bid, the next overbid, okay? Okay, and um, so somehow, what you have to do in incentives, to re realize on a proof that people are incentivized to do the right thing, is to reward people for raving the potential of doing an action, not of performing the action. The moment in which you reward the action itself, you get minors, you get all kinds of things. And believe it or not, if you have this indirect way, you actually have your cake and eat it too. Okay, I think that's one more short question. Um, in your paper, so, sorry, I, I, I'm here until my time is up, uh, which is another five minutes. But I want to see, first of all, there is another question. Do you mind, just in case? Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd be happy, and after the talk, we can talk. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, you have mentioned several times that you use the more money I have, the more rights, voting rights, uh, precision rights I have uh, in your album. In several occasions, several cases. So I want to ask how you implement it with two facts, basically. First one is, uh, for example, in Bitcoin, you don't keep your money in one wallet. But you can have 1,000 wallets and you know a small portion of every wallet. So you cannot define you know, for sure who has more money or who, has, who basically owns the biggest amounts of the algorithm. And second uh, question in regard to this, uh, in some way, you know, it's kind of in the democracy giving more voting rights to people that pay more taxes. So, you know, it creates some kind of disbalance, not equal rights, and at some point you will end with 10 people, 10% 10, 10 of the users owning and deciding about 99% of all decisions in the, in the system. Uh, um, so how you cope with uh, that? Okay, so, Sorry to cut you off, because now the next, the next question is going to be have a three-part question. <laughs> so, okay, but that. anyway, okay, that's okay. No, 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 when we go back to... So, uh, the more money you have, the more... No, 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 it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. So first of all, um, you must decide. So, I believe that in a, in a money system, so it is the natural thing to do to, to have one token, one the same influence of every other token, okay? But if some, if you have 100 more tokens than me, it's only right because you have more to lose and you have more invested in the proper working of the system than I do. If I participate and, um, and I put here 10 euros, okay, in the blockchain, so, I, you know, and you put, you know, a million euros, I mean, you really want that nobody censored, right? For instance, more than I do. Because if somebody, if somebody censored, is bad for you, but is less bad for me. Because if you want to go to an artisan and buy a sofa, I like your sofa, you'd like to take, you know, this uh, 1,000 algos. I say, well, uh, I understand that, you know, the, the danger is that, you know, people are censored. So if you give me this 1,000 algo, I might be unable to spend it. You don't want this, otherwise nobody accepts your money. So in, in a money system, in a political system, is a terrible idea, right? Don't use it. In a money system, that is actually the right thing. In any case, proof of work, if you buy my argument, whoever has more money can buy more money and equipment, is another uh, oligopoly of a different type. But is, um, this is actually much more uh, aligned. And, um, 
And second of all, um, the way technically to, to implement it is that you, know, uh, you don't need to know how many people, remember everything is a public key king, particularly if you take the uh, idea of Harry that I uh, described before I did, in which you, you, if you implement it right, you don't even know who has, owns this public key. So the public key has right. And these rights are, the, uh, are, are the, not, not rights, rather, as an influence, so as a, the participates in more committee if the public key owns more money. So it doesn't matter if uh, you don't give a, um, power to me as Silvio. If I have two public keys and I want to divide my money equally, uh, I have half the probability of being selected from one key and another half from the other key. And if my overall probability is one in a million, I have you know a million over two in one key and a million over two. So it doesn't matter. So it's up to me how, how I want to divide uh, my money. But uh, the participation uh, to this committee is uh, due only to the uh, uh, it goes with the key. By the way, because I said that in algorithm computation is trivial, let me tell you that there is a lot of technology to make it trivial. Why? Because if you say that uh, the fundamental unit, as it should be, is the token, a token as a, must have a probability by individual lottery to figure out if it's part of the committee or not. And if I now I own, say, a billion token, now I, I, some uh, operation may be trivial done for one token by multiplied by a billion. You know, a microsecond times a billion is not is a quite a few, uh, quite a, is a month or time, right? So is that's a very long computation. So the trick is to implement the triviality of computation to say that independent how many tokens are assigned to a key, the operation to determine of the lawyer to determine whether you have uh, you participate in the committee has to be the same. And it is the same. But it requires uh, mathematics to solve this problem because otherwise the trivial way to do it is to say, oh, I have a million tokens, I have to do a million time token by token of this operation, and that doesn't scale, that, uh, that is not any longer efficient, right? Thank you. Yes. Thanks. <laughs>